Before we go diving right into the text from Revelation chapter 7 this morning, I wanted to take just a few minutes to preface all of this uh, by talking about perspective. Um, that's a word that you probably use at least on a semi-frequent basis, right? Maybe when one of your friends is going through a, a tough time, a rough stretch of life, you say something like, well, you've just got to just keep your perspective, right? Maybe even when you're offering your opinion about something, um, you, politics or sports or whatever it is, you'd say something, something like, well, from my perspective, um, Lamar Jackson is the indisputable MVP of the NFL, or, or from my perspective, this candidate or that candidate uh, is the best one for this job. Um, really, at its root, perspective is the way or, or, or the manner that you view something. It's your viewpoint, your vantage point on a given subject, right? Uh, and so your perspective then really determines the, 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 the attitude that you approach something with. Or, or maybe you could also even say it determines your relationship toward whatever it is that you are viewing. Um, now, for a good case study in perspective, I'm going to turn to two of my favorite literary characters. They've been around for about 100 years, and I am talking about Winnie the Pooh and Eeyore, okay? Um, if you know anything about Winnie the Pooh and Eeyore, uh, it's that they have very, very different personalities, right? Um, Eeyore approaches almost everything in life with this sort of doom and gloom mistrust, okay? Um, whereas Pooh... Bear approaches everything with the sort of uh, unconquerable optimism, right? Um, for example, one day in the Hundred Acre Wood, uh, Winnie the Pooh comes upon Eeyore standing by the stream, and he says, Good day, Eeyore! To which Eeyore replies, Good day, Pooh, if it even is a good day. Now understand that both of them are experiencing the same weather. They both have food to eat. They both have friends to spend a, an awful lot of free time with. And yet, Eeyore sad, Winnie the Pooh happy. Well, it just so happens that this particular day uh, also happens to be Eeyore's birthday, only everybody has forgotten. And so he is in sort of an extra gloomy mood well, Pooh Bear is quite happy. Uh, and so this teaches us actually the first thing that I want you to remember about perspective today, the first main thing. Um, and it's that perspective is very easily influenced by our immediate circumstances in life. Okay, so that's the first thing. We're not done with Winnie the Pooh and Eeyore just yet. Don't worry, I'll get to, I'll get to Revelation in the Bible in a little bit. Um, we need to learn one more lesson though first from these two. Um, and it's that if you've, if you've read any of the stories, if, if you're familiar with, with any of those works, you would also know that Winnie the Pooh is always getting himself into trouble. Okay, he climbs a tree to get some honey and he gets attacked by bees. Goes to his friend Rabbit's house and he eats so much honey that he gets stuck in the hole while he is trying to exit Rabbit's house. If anything, Winnie the Pooh faces way more, difficult, uh, way more difficulties and hardships than Eeyore ever does. And yet Winnie the Pooh is able to remain cheerful through all of it while Eeyore is always sad and gloomy, right? And that's because Winnie the Pooh still knows that at the end of the day, he has honey in his tummy, a roof over his head, and his good friends by his side. And that teaches us the second big thing about perspective today. Um, it's that uh, having a the proper understanding of all the relevant information, seeing the big picture, if you will, is crucial in having a healthy perspective and outlook on life. Now, we often like to play the part of Eeyore, don't we? And for some of you, maybe it's just about always. And why? It's because these two eyes lodged in my skull can only see so far, right? And so our immediate circumstances influence our perspective so much that the bigger picture can become very, very clouded, maybe even invisible or forgotten altogether. But in today's reading from Revelation, God shows us the rest of the data, the rest of the information required 
for us to form a proper perspective and outlook on our lives. Yeah, in Revelation, maybe more than any, maybe more than, than any other book in the Bible, we get a, a very realistic view of the hardships of life and everything that Christians especially are going to have to go through. And yet we also get to see the end game. And it's that end game, the rest of the information, the big picture, at the end of life's incredible struggle, which provides us with enduring hope and reminds us to keep a proper perspective over all of this. Now, as we open up with these verses today, um, John, is, John is kind of an onlooker with everything that's going on here. The disciple John is in exile on the island of Patmos, and he's receiving these visions from the Lord. Now, Revelation pretty frequently jumps in and out of this pattern that we might call John sees, John does, where he will go from simply being a spectator to becoming a very involved player in the scene. Um, now, when we start this out, John is just the spectator, okay? So John is reporting what he is seeing. He's writing this in letters to all of these different churches. So he's reporting what God is showing him. He says, and you can follow along in your service folder too. He says, after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so John is witnessing this heavenly scene. He knows where he is, but he doesn't exactly know what's going on. Um, it would kind of be like me in the middle of an art gallery. I might be able to describe to you what a painting looks like, but if you were to press me on the, the details or the techniques or the meaning of that painting, I would be entirely clueless, okay? Um, well, now at verse 13, this stops being a spectator sport. Now John is actually drawn into the scene himself as if he is suddenly becoming a part of a movie that he was watching, okay? Uh, so verse 13, John continues reporting. He says, Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? Okay, so John is seeing this magnificent scene full of, of angels and the four living creatures and the throne of God and the Lamb. And then this elder comes up to him and says, hey, John. And he points out what might have been the least impressive aspect of this entire scene that John was seeing. The people who are standing there wearing white robes. Well, John answers him. He says, sir, you know. Right? John is watching the scene, but he doesn't know anything really about what's going on any more than I could explain the details of a, of a Picasso painting to you. Well, now, verse 14, we read, And he said, the elder said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. And just like that, John is way more involved in this scene than he realized. You see, that the, the Greek word that we translate as tribulation uh, is the word philipsis. I'll say that one more time. Philipsis, okay? Um, not, a, not a word that we use in English, obviously. It's not even sounds that we would usually put together in English. Um, a, a philipsis indicates, though, it's more than just a hardship or a, a tough stretch of life. Um, a philipsis indicates something a little more like absolute crushing pressure. Okay, maybe, maybe it would help to think of this like in the original Star Wars movie when Luke Skywalker and friends are on the Death Star and they wind up in the trash compactor and what happens? The walls start closing in on them, right? And inch by inch those walls are moving together and they are going to crush and destroy anything and anybody that is between them. Now take that image and rotate it 90 degrees and you have slipsis. Okay, it is, this, it is this crushing weight that is going to 
absolutely flatten you into a pancake. The Apostle John, and the reason I said before that he is immediately in, like drawn into all of this is because the Apostle John knew from personal experience Philipsis probably a lot better than anybody in this room ever has or ever will. John's brother, James. John, John was an old man by this point, by the way. He's probably about 90 years old. Um, his brother, James, one of the 12 disciples, had been the first one, the first martyr, to fall under the sword of the, the persecutioners. One by one over the years, John watched as his other best friends in the world, the other 12 disciples, were martyred. John himself was in a lonely exile on the rocky island of Patmos right now, far away from his uh, congregation, far away from his Christian brothers and sisters in Ephesus. He knew what it was like. The whole Christian world knew what it was like at that time. They were persecuted, they were hunted, jailed, and oftentimes slaughtered with less dignity than a lot of animals get when they die. So the perspective of John and of a lot of Christians living in the Roman Empire at that time must have been an incredibly cloudy and confused one. Didn't Jesus care? Wasn't he supposed to be their good shepherd? Why had he abandoned them to this kind of suffering? Understand that tribulation was not just an occasion of John's life. His life by this point was saturated with flipsis. But are things really all that much different 2,000 years later? I mean, yes. Obviously, the specifics and some of the circumstances have changed. But tribulation is just as real now as it was back then. Life on this planet is pretty messed up sometimes, isn't it? So what I want you to ask yourself today is this. What's your tribulation? Your thesis. What, what did you walk into church with this morning that is just an absolute weight on your heart and on your life? What is it that, that keeps you tossing and turning throughout the night? Is it the most recent visit that you had at the doctor's? Or maybe the most recent visit that your kid or maybe your parent or some other loved one had with that doctor? Maybe it's the image of the coffin, the hole in the ground, the gravestone that you still visit on a pretty frequent basis. Is it the, the pressure to live up to, to perfection or at least to live up to, to certain standards, whether, whether, it's, whether it's at work or, or at school, and, and knowing that because nobody is perfect, you're going to fail What's crushing you today? Now, all of those things are, are what you might consider, you might call exterior pressures, okay? They're, they're not necessarily things that you have a whole lot of control over, okay? They're, they're things that enter life and just cause pain. They cause hardship, okay? Um, and yet, as the, as the exterior pressure increases on you, the interior pressure increases as well. And when that happens, what we learn is that the problem isn't just out there. The problem is in here, too. Uh, for example, if I take this tube of toothpaste and I apply enough exterior pressure to it, what's going to come out? This is a question I am asking you. <laughs> toothpaste, right? Well, how do you know that? Because that's what's inside, right? And when we find ourselves 
squeezed by the external pressures of life, what's inside of us comes out, and that usually is not very pretty, is it? For example, the, the, the stress, the pressure of, a, of a, a, a dissatisfying job or maybe an unsympathetic boss might squeeze out of you this person who comes home and just so easily lashes out and condescends your spouse or your kids. Maybe the, the squeeze of a bitter or boring marriage brings out unfaithfulness or, or, or a turn to pornography or something like that. Maybe that squeeze brings out of you uh, anxiety or self-esteem issues or substance abuse or worry or a thousand other nasty little monsters that live within us. And then all of those things inevitably cause problems of their own in your life, right? And it all just gets heaped and heaped and heaped on your shoulders along with all of those exterior pressures that you don't have any control over and all of this together makes up this tribulation, this life. Look, I, I know that life is hard. I've been there before in certain ways. I'm there right now and I know that I will be there in the future. And some days it just feels like we are never going to be free. Not from those, those external dangers, not from the inner demons, not free from, from any of it. But the reason we feel that way so strongly sometimes is because our lives are kind of like those of a goldfish living in a fishbowl, right? There's so much more of reality in the world than what's going on inside that little spherical foot of water. But because the fish is stuck in that bowl, its entire perspective is, is shaped by that, is shaped by what it knows. And that's why what God does here is so stinking cool, I think. He shows this to John. He shows John this incredible scene in the throne room of heaven with all of these multitudes, all of these saints who have come out of that great tribulation. And when we remember what John has seen, the larger and greater reality, the reality outside the fishbowl that is this life, it reminds us of our proper perspective, the bigger picture. John sees these multitudes here, only they aren't scared. They're safe. They aren't weeping. They're all, every last one of them, rejoicing. The question is how? How do these multitudes arrive from the great tribulation of this life safely into this scene of paradise? Well, let's read, let's read on that next little sentence as the elder continues. He's speaking to John and he says, They have washed their robes and made them white, in the blood of the Lamb. You know, for all the blood and sweat and tears that the multitudes once shed, that is not what allows them into this scene of paradise as though it were like the, the price of their admission. The price was indeed blood, just not theirs. It's the blood of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb. For all the tribulations, all the the flipses that you and I face in this life, no one has ever suffered and ever gone through it like Jesus did. No one has ever faced that down like the Lamb had to. Although he knew the, the glory of heaven's throne room, he gave all of that up to come here at Christmas time as this little baby to join us in our tribulation. And then in order to save us, to rescue us from our tribulation, he endured the greatest tribulation. When he was heralded into Jerusalem with the palm branches, he was not coming to conquer. He was not coming to, to ascend to a throne, but to ascend to a cross. He was coming not to wear a crown of gold, but to wear a crown of thorns. Coming not as a king to conquer, but as the lamb to the slaughter, coming not to wrap around himself a kingly robe, 
but instead to wear on his shoulders all the sins of all humanity for all time. And as he underwent his great tribulation, the lamb kept his perspective, kept that bigger picture in mind. You know, the good shepherd, he could have decided that the sheep weren't worth the cost, weren't worth his tribulation. His disciples abandoned him. They all ran away when he was arrested. Why not abandon them now? Those crowds condemned him to die. Why not condemn them to eternal death in hell? He could have decided that this world, that you and me, were not worth his tribulation. But he didn't. The Lamb kept his eternal perspective on this. The end game. The purpose. The goal. You. Me. Standing right there with the multitudes in this very scene. John saw your face there just as Jesus saw your face there. Wearing white robes whose filth has been bleached away by the blood of the Lamb, by the blood of Jesus who takes away the sin of the world. His love for you kept his sight, kept his perspective here. And so he bore the unbearable tribulation to give you this future. And as he was also raised in Ken, he now lives to shepherd you through this tribulation to this scene of everlasting safety. Therefore, because of this, because of the Lamb's blood, I want you who are currently undergoing this tribulation to bear in mind and see what is coming. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. My brothers and sisters, this vision is yours. It belongs to you just as much as it belonged to John when he saw it. This is what the Lamb's blood has won for you. You see, when Jesus on his cross cried out those words, It is finished, this marked an end to his suffering. But not only his. It marked the end of our suffering too. Your good shepherd, the Lamb Jesus, he sees where you are at right now. And he knows that it hurts so badly and it hurts so often. But do not for a moment think that means the Lamb has abandoned you. He has invested everything in you. His own blood and his own life. And he is now shepherding you through this tribulation to your everlasting deliverance. My son, he says, I have seen you struggling through the years with your deep depression. And I know it hurts. But when you get where I am, it is finished. My daughter, he says, I have seen your pillow soaked with tears that you shed over your miscarried child. But I promise that I love you. And I promise that when you arrive where I am, it is finished. My lambs, I have felt the trembling of your hearts as you fear the uncertain future. I have listened to your cries as you have mourned over your dead, lo your dead loved ones. I have tasted the bitterness of, uh, of your heart as loneliness consumed you. I have felt the piercing knife of your guilt as you have wept over your secret sins. And I know how much it hurts because I am the man of sorrows. But just stay the course. Because when you get where I am waiting for you, it is finished. I'm going to dry your tears forever, little sheep. Your tribulation will come to an end. All of your sad things will come undone again. And you will be at rest <clears throat> under my tent, in my green pastures, beside my quiet waters, as you dwell in the house of the Lamb of the Lord forever. Amen.